The Reynolds family on my father's side, they're all from the East Coast out here and they're a dynastic family. You know, like my, my great grandfather, a man named Don Potter Reynolds was the architect of uh, the head of engineering for the president as the president of the American Society of Civil Engineering back in the 80s. And he's the one who put the new torch in the Luciferian hand of the Statue of Liberty of Columbia. Hmm. And so he's a master Mason Luciferian in that way. And he was so much of the shot caller for the family at that time, especially when I came into being. And, uh, but my dad left that thing and began, moved out to the Southwest and started a different empire. And so a lot of how it works in the families is you, you got two main approaches. If you've got unlimited access to wealth, power, like really, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about power, like unlimited raw power, where a phone call, the phone book is far more powerful than the bank account because it's who you know can open doors to power anywhere mm. else in the entire world. And that's where everything was. So you can leave with nothing, but then you can go build. And if you need the phone book, there's a price to be paid. And the price to be paid is generally one of your children. This is like the reality. It, it seems bizarre to some, but a child is generally a chosen child out of the family is given over as an offering to the family. And they're the ones who's gonna go through this left-hand path. They're gonna experience the desecration of their soul, their identity, and they're gonna become an agent for the family that is owned completely. And there's like a legal trustee that is given over to it. There's a board of directors that sits over it. Like these are real legal confines for how the wealth is distributed out there. And so in order to build your empire, you gotta be able to go prove yourself. And that's what he ended up doing out in the Southwest. And he moved to Arizona, an area called Flagstaff, Arizona. And where I was born, that is a place that's a high place, Mount Humphreys. It's a volcanic peak that sit there. And the top of it is where the Hopi Indian and a lot of people had gathered forever to commune with the fallen. They believed that the sons of the sky would come down every season at the winter solstice and they would abide from the winter solstice to the summer solstice there. And so this was a place where they would give their daughters over to them. This is Hopi mythology, like 101, you know, and they would make these Kachina dolls, which were an effigy of the, fall, of the, the what I would say is a watcher angel that would come and the daughter would be given to him and she would place that over her bed throughout her life, you know, and that was where, that's her familiar spirit, right? That's where I was born into. And the people that still practice that old religion, that's the way I referred to it, they still do this and they still take their children up there to give them over to them on these high days. And so I was born into that and I was born through that seed line and into that ritual magic world. And, um, but my, my mother's side are extreme Catholics and Jesuits through and through. And so her father ran a different operation in Southern California, which was much more based on the child exploitation side of the equation. And he operated out of Lake Havasu City, Arizona. Lake Havasu, for those of you that are unfamiliar, sits in the absolute desert border of Arizona and California. And it has the Colorado River that's been dammed up and they created an artificial lake there. And it was a secret military base back in World War II that was called uh, Site 6. And it was a stopover point uh, crossing the desert for soldiers going there. And they would made it into a rest and recuperation area. And so it was a party city from its foundation. It had a lot of underground structures that were built into it as a refueling point. And in the 1960s, a guy named Robert P. McCulloch bought it. And he bought it and he also purchased the London Bridge that crossed the River Thames. And he had it shipped over here stone by stone. And while they were doing that, they excavated 80 bodies that were entombed inside it in a practice that's called anirment, where you would sacrifice a person and bury them alive in the walls of the foundation. And so there's all these chambers in this facility of the London Bridge where they would do torture and uh, all kinds of ritual stuff. But this is why the sing-song nursery rhyme, the London Bridge is falling down, falling down. That's a nursery rhyme to talk about how you have to give your children over to the government so you can hold up the London Bridge and they would literally take their children. They've, this is in the history book of the museum at Lake Havasu City. You can see these bodies of these children that were sacrificed inside the walls of that space. So he bought that as a charged object. He bought that as a, tort as a portal mechanism. And they built in Lake Havasu City with another designer from Le the Disneyland and they literally built a pleasure island. That's what it was facilitated for. And they, they designed it so that it would be a retirement community that would facilitate the exploitation of children. And that's exclusively what that city was founded and built for. And so the, the, the original founders of that operated out of the Knights of Columbus predominantly as a wing of the Jesuits. And that's the business down there. It's an industry to cover up child. You got a bunch of old men running around with little boys and everybody thinks they're grandchildren and grand, you know, nephews and nieces and all that rest. And so all along that area down there is where I would be taken from my earliest days and shattered abused, traumatized, Jeez. systemically so. Um, but it's for behavioral modifications purposes. That's the end goal of, of the, uh, the abuse.
is to shatter your willingness to resist and to break your will. And once they own you and you have been woefully convinced you can never get out, you're, you give in. And that's what, uh, that's what happened. I became the person who I was died, you know, and the person they wanted me to become was what was born out of that disgusting Phoenix ashes, you know? How, all right, how long does that process take? I mean, was this like just, just a few years of your childhood mm. or was this like a constant thing throughout your teen years or what? Mm. I mean, it, every individual is different. How long does it take to break a dog? Mm. That's the, that was the approach they took with me. You know, you find out every, everybody has different talents and giftings and capabilities and capacities. And so the, in the beginning phase, a lot of it is you're just raising them up a little more normally. There's a lot of early trauma stuff that's hard to articulate and can be messy with memory. And, and, but as I got older, like five and six years old, man, it, it became very apparent that I had a desire for justice. That was like the sole deepest desire that I had, you know, was I wanted to, I wanted people to know freedom because I had been so deprived of it from day one. And there was no, there's, there's this practice of switching mothers. They have cult, you'll have a cult mother and then they have your regular mom. And then they create this trauma bonding so that you'll bond with anybody that they want you to do. And this happens by taking you away from your mom and your dad constantly and giving you new mom and dad, new uncles, new aunts. Right. And so you're living in this constant state of destabilization. And so it's, it's as that destabilization happens and that patterning is built up, that's when a lot of the programming comes in to stabilize these new personalities and these new pursuits and endeavors. But I had this zealousness to see injustice stopped and they preyed on that. And so they gave me opportunities to fight back against these perverts who are abusing children and they would build up in me this rage, this need for vengeance. And then they would let me release that on somebody. And in the beginning, it was people I knew were bad guys, guys I'd seen abuse children. And I would slice their throats up, man. I would tear them to freaking ribbons. And I loved it because I finally felt like I could stop something that I knew was evil. And I thought this was the way to stop all these monsters in the world. I just wanted to hunt monsters in the night. I just wanted to go down in the tunnels and hunt. And that's what they kind of created in me, this just freak of a need to hunt. And then they would bury that away and you go back to normal life and you go back to Christian school and you go back to the Whoa. regular life and your parents act like it's just normal, you know, but they're like, you, you got to have cover stories for why your child's all beat up and bruised and your face is smashed. And like, I've had multiple reconstructed plastic surgeries from fights, you know, like fighting for my stinking life. You got to have cover stories. So we would move around constantly. My parents would move us around every, sometimes every six months or not. But once you have a friend or a teacher or somebody notices, starts asking questions or you start bonding with somebody that's outside the cult. They're not going to tolerate that. And so we would move all the time. And now my sisters on the other side, they weren't roped into this thing. I was in a male cult. This is the Brotherhood of the Snake down in Lake Havasu. But this is, uh, my sisters weren't caught up in the same thing, but they were caught up by the family as a whole. And so this carried on and we moved into this place called Sholo Pine Top Lakeside, Arizona. And this is where an area, they would move to these specific high places where the veil is really thin. There's a very famous story about uh, a guy who had an alien encounter out there Snowflake, Arizona. And uh, this is an area where there's, I was right on the Apache Re Reservation, White Mountain Apache Reservation was 100 yards from my door. And they would go out into the Apache Reservation to these specific high places and do these rituals and this ritual magic. And a lot of that involved, that was when it was the worst to me because I was old enough to understand how vile what was happening, you know, in ritual magic. And at the same time, I was the most readily influenced by the family side of the equation. I thought the family and the military was the way out, but I hated this occult side of it because I saw, I mean, I saw men become monsters physically in front of my eyes. Other things come out of people's mouths. Other things come through their eyes. Like I, I witnessed enough trans transfiguration to know that this stuff is 100% stalking in the darkness. And I don't want that to rule me forever, you know, but it was hard to not resist you know, you're just, you're in it. Well, so, all right. Seeing things like that, like you say, all right. So you, you said you saw men become monsters. Is that metaphorically or literally? It's literally. I've seen men do nasty things like, a, like an animal, but then I've seen men become not people. 
like literally literally not change. treat the people yeah okay. and there's there is like lycanthropy and there's these understandings of what the watchers are capable of doing that most people are just woefully ignorant of and that's why they're perishing it's because they lack a basic understanding of of history mm. and one of the predominant understandings of what a watcher specific class of celestial beings is capable of is augmenting itself they can shape shift mm. that is by their nature they're literally called metaschizmazitoi in the greek in the new testament and it's because he says it's marvel not because Hasatan trans trans you could say like transforms himself. That's a good word for it. But he shape shifts himself into an angel of light. And his messengers, his apostles, disciples, they do the same thing. And he's like, this is because they are capable of becoming anything they want to be in order to deceive on one side of the equation. And that's what they'll do. And so when people start engaging in these necromantic rituals and other stuff, and they start to Im seek the embodiment of these celestial ones. They can get these things on them and in them and they can't contain them. And some of these guys who are messing with this stuff who don't come from the bloodline are incapable of cohabitating like a parasite and they feed off of each other and they can't handle it. And so that's why families are recruited from these bloodlines and children are recruited out, even if they don't know anything about it. Like you said, the vast majority of people who come from these bloodlines, there's a lot of muddying of the waters. There's a lot of purity that's been changed. There's a lot of half-breeds. And there's a lot of quarter breeds, right? There's a lot of people that don't know this stuff and they start to get into lesser magic. And all of a sudden, it's like the doors of everybody open to them. But that's why. It's because they can host these things better. Whereas those that don't, they get taken over by this stuff and they can't change back. They can't, they can't, really? they can't re return in a sense. Like people become completely possessed and are incapable of expelling the darkness after that. And who do you turn to? You're like, you're going to go to the Catholic guy who's all into the same thing that you're into, you know, like most people don't understand what a real deliverance is required for somebody that has gone down this far down where they are the consuming people. Like that's a deep, devastating, psychological, spiritual shock, physical, your liver, like the health. I, this is why I'm a huge into health because I physically had to try to find ways to help people who have done all of these things. Like the consumption of human blood does horrific things to the human body. You know, and this is a major practice within this. These families do drink blood. That's why we have these, these vampire class of people. It's not some kind of myth. People consume blood in order to live, extend their life force. Like this is a normal thing. You've got billionaires today who admit it on Joe Rogan podcasts and other yeah. places where they're like, yeah, I use the blood of my son and all that. Like you don't understand this is a religion, you know, and this is a highly effective means of augmenting yourself. And so these, these watchers will give people this power. Their priest class will dispense that to people who want to go into you know, like what I come from down there in the, the Apache reservation was the um, the people that that slip between realms and become animals. You know, and it's it's a. Uh, you are hitting things that are confirming so many things that, like, I speak hypothetically about, almost in the sense that, like, I believe but I can't prove kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, like, for instance, uh, years ago I had a guy on the show, and um, he didn't say it on the show. So I, I, I usually don't say his name because people, some people know who I'm talking about. Some people don't, but because he didn't say it on the show, I don't, I don't know why I didn't say it on the show. Um, but he said that he was a former, I guess, I forget, like Satanist or whatever. Like he, he, he came from a deep line of this stuff. And he said at one point, he said, he says at one point people have to make a decision, uh, whether they're going to go the vampire route or the, like the werewolf route. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he said that he was told by somebody who went the werewolf route that he, that he should go vampire because doing werewolf is like the most painful thing you'll ever experience in your entire life. Um, I don't know. I, I, I can't say factually how true that is or not, but you're saying a lot of similar things. And now you're saying that there's traversing realms involved with this. So are you, are you, so you're saying, are you saying that there are people who, who are traversing realms because of their ability to change into these things or are those two separate categories? Or sometimes I, the same. I would say it like this. The reason, the reason that there's these First Nation people have preserved these priest class, right? Just all across the world. This isn't just like localized to white European people. There are people here who practice this type of same old religion and they call them skinwalkers. That's mm -hmm. a name for them. Right. But these, these witches and warlocks that practice these things, you know, they go and rob graves and they take the infant's bones out and they grind them into powders, you know, and they use that as poisons, you know, like that. So 
the Jesuits was this like massive assassination team training group that was operating there that started training me. Well, then it was like you needed to learn this spiritual side of assassination and hunting and stalking. Mm. And that's where the skinwalkers and the Navajo and the Diné are like way, they have a different priest class that does that. And so that's what I got put out there for because they do stuff like slipping between realms. We call them shadow walkers in the industry. Like these are guys that that have this means to go between spaces. And so where they're, you can't hear them, you can't see them, you can't detect them. You're, they're not on thermal, but there are certain types of ways that you can detect them. So it's like you, you have to get kind of raised up into these arts. And these are like, this is why we call it like, this is to me, the realm of Azazel. I'm just convinced that this is all Azazel's kingdom. In that realm and that side of it and people are just branching off of of his tree of knowledge and good and evil side of it you know and he's the ultimately the one that was teaching men these ways of war in that sense of it but like just like with the, what happened with nebuchadnezzar man they cursed him with lycanthropy daniel warns him hey don't go down that road he, he you got a dream from the most high don't do it and he did it anyway he said the watchers are going to curse you and that's literally what they did man they cursed him and made him a beast they took him down the lycanthropy road because that's what they do, man. His hair grew out. His nails grew out. Like he became a different thing that if you and I spotted it on camera, we would say it's a cryptid. We would call these things cryptids because we don't have a, a proper working knowledge of history and understanding why people call these things these names. But the vampire side of the equation, it is. They tend to be much more human masquerading, whereas you get much more feral production when people start to take this other route of becoming a beast. That's kind of the options that they give people in that world. But I believe a lot of the guys that you see out there or who are experiencing these things, they're, they're loose assets for families. Like these are guard dogs on estates. Like that's literally, there was a training program I had to go to when I was nine years old. And we'd go up to this farm in Michigan that was in the family, my dad's cousin. And they train all of these police, military, law enforcement, and VIP protection dogs, you know, but then they have other cages that are man-sized cages for other stuff because that gets brought in by the families, you know? And it's like some of these are people that are just beasts, like physically people that are like, not like the rest of us, strength-wise, speed-wise, power-wise, intelligence-wise. And then others of them are just unrecognizable as anything related to man. And so- Is that is that uh, their ability, the strength, intelligence, is that something that is brought on through uh, ritual or is it brought in on through like medical injections mm. you know like uh, i've heard stories of you know military injecting you know people with things and they essentially become a super soldier mm. um is it that kind of stuff or or a combination or what i think it's just both it depends on who's got high tech and who's got the uh, old tech mm. you know and the old tech is generally superior the new tech has side effects you know when people are getting injections and are using you know recombinant DNA to start augmenting stuff. There's other variables that are unpredictable, you know, whereas if you just use a different spirit, you can predict what it's going to be. You know, that's like when a, when a skinwalker kills, that's what you have to go through, man. I'm nine years old and I have to stink and kill somebody with my hands, a friend, a person that I love because my family was not somebody I loved. And so part of the, the in order to be inhabited by these spirits that will shapeshift you and allow you to become a different creature, you're going to kill somebody that you love and you're going to kill them with your bare hands. You're going to breathe in their life as they die. Hmm. And it's, it's when you do that, that this, this stuff comes on you and it's, that's what, that's the stuff that makes you convinced you can never be redeemed. I believe it. 